Hello everyone, how are you today? Welcome back to a first month philosophy. I cannot believe it is March already. So today I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. Usually I just kind of talk about a theory or theories, that type of thing. But I thought it'd be fun if I would just read one of my papers. So this is the paper I've been working on for literally years. And I recently just submitted it to hopefully, fingers crossed, get published. Um, yeah, so it's a intern into a debate about permissivism and disagreement. Don't worry, I'm going to get into what that means. Yeah, so I guess without further ado, let's get into it. So permissivism and disagreement are both largely debated topics in philosophy, specifically in the branch of epistemology. So if you remember, I think it was like my second ish video where I just like talk about different like branches and schools of philosophy epistemology is like in the analytic tradition so permissivism says that there are possible cases in which you rationally believe p where p is just like a variable could be anything yet it is consistent with your being rational in possessing your current evidence so the same evidence you hold for p you're still rational in also believing not P instead. So the negation or the opposite of the other belief. So that's like a very formal definition from this guy named Roger White. But in short, literally, it means you can believe this one thing, P, or this other thing, not P, and it's rational to hold both of them based on the evidence you have. That's what permissivism says. So for example, imagine you're part of a jury. I think this is the example that kind of like illustrates this the best. So as part of a jury, you're analyzing evidence to determine whether an accused is guilty or not guilty. So P or not P, right? On this view, you can rationally believe the accused is guilty. You can rationally believe P. Yet it's also consistent and fully rational to believe the accused is not guilty instead. So again, fully rational to believe P and not P, guilty and not guilty. Disagreement involves epistemic peers, which are like epistemic equals. So more specifically on like epistemic peers, they have equality in evidential possession and equality in evidential possessing, processing, not possessing, evidential processing. So what does that mean? It's kind of like the jury example again. So you are all getting presented with the same evidence. You're all processing it in like the same or similar ways through epistemic peers. So the former kind indicates that epistemic peers have equally good evidence pertaining to a proposition. And though the evidence is not identical, uh, it still falls in that. So it doesn't need to be the exact same. It just has to be like the same types of evidence. You know what I mean? So the latter, the uh, evidential processing, uh, it's so named because it indicates that the peers are equal in how they're able to process evidence. So this includes having equally good faculties. So like visual perception, intelligence, memory, that type of thing, and intellectual virtues. So like open-mindedness, intellectual courage, thoughtfulness, that type of thing. And these aid in belief forming about a proposition. So with epistemic peers, peer disagreement is when epistemic peers arrive at different views about the question on the basis of their common evidence. So this is, we see this a lot in like, like politics, for example. Let's assume there is like a conservative and a liberal politician going head to head in an election, which is typically the case. Um, let's also assume that they have the same evidence on 
a specific issue and they have the same type of education. I know like politicians come from all wide range of backgrounds, but let's just assume that for a moment. And then they disagree on the issue, which tends to happen with like liberals versus conservatives. So that would be an example of peer disagreement. So unlike permissivism, the debate around peer disagreement surrounds what to do when epistemic peers disagree. Imagine once again, that you are part of a jury. I know, I like this example. As part of the story, you're analyzing evidence to determine whether an accused is guilty or not guilty. In this scenario, the evidence yields a hung jury. So like completely split. Assuming all the members are epistemic peers, the question becomes, should the whole jury reevaluate the evidence or should you change your stance to that of your epistemic peers who disagree with you? So I will discuss that question further on in this paper. So the classical approach to epistemology is evidentialism. So evidentialism says that each of us must build all of our knowledge and justified belief on a foundation of evidence to which we have a privileged access. And this comes from a guy named Fumerton. In both theories, permissivism and disagreement, the question posed regards whether a person can rationally hold belief A or belief B on the premise of the same evidence. E, we just use E for evidence, makes sense. So in this paper, one I'm gonna go through today for this video, I investigated the question of whether epistemic peer disagreement is an acceptable form of permissivism. I'm gonna clarify all the terms, so don't worry, hang in there. I'm gonna find and present the distinct types of permissivism because they're different types. And then do the same with epistemic peer disagreement because there's different types of that as well. Uh, so following the, all those definitions, distinctions, yada, 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 uh, I discuss the various arguments for and against each proposition. I'm gonna offer my own opinion where necessary. And then I'm gonna compare the two topics, uh, the differences and the similarities between them. And then to conclude, I will be arguing that permissivism is false but that does not mean we have to change our opinions when we encounter peer disagreement. So I'm gonna start with permissivism here because it's, in my opinion, uh, the most whack theory. As I said, I will be arguing against permissivism. So in short, permissivism holds that it is sometimes rationally possible to have different conclusions based on the same properties, right? Permissivism is a denial of uniqueness. So uniqueness is another theory that is held to a high standard in epistemology, much like evidentialism, which I talked about earlier. So uniqueness is defined as the view that for any given proposition P, again, we're gonna continue using that variable, there is just one rationally permissible doxastic attitude one can take given a particular body of evidence. So I know that sounds like a, a mouthful. Don't even worry about what dark acid attitude means, but basically it is that for any body of evidence, you follow evidentialism and there's one, there is one rational conclusion to be made on that. That's, that's all that means. So philosophers such as Rick Peel and Anthony Books argue in their book why responsible belief is permissible belief, published in 2014, for accounts of strong permissivism and of moderate permissivism. So strong permissivism says that it is rationally permissible for an agent to hold at least two doxastic attitudes given the very same evidence. So just for clarity, um, since I am saying it like over and over again, a doxastic attitude is an attitude that pertains to a belief and includes belief, disbelief, suspension of judgment, anything that, like any of those attitudes you can take towards belief. So to illustrate this, I will pull an example from Roger White, who I mentioned earlier. 
suppose I'm on a criminal jury in a criminal trial. Yeah, in a criminal trial. And I'm asked to determine whether the accused, we'll call him Smith, is guilty or not guilty. Considering the evidence provided in court, I rashly conclude that Smith is guilty. But that being said, I could rationally conclude that, again, considering all the evidence provided in court, that Smith is innocent. So from this notion, White concludes that it is impossible that my examination of the evidence makes it rational for me to believe that Smith is guilty, but also rational to believe instead that he is innocent. As it is such a radical departure from the uniqueness theory. So Roger White is a defender of the uniqueness theory, as many analytic philosophers are. So he is basically saying that just because like on the basis of permissivism violating this uniqueness theory that's why like we can't hold it rationally if that makes sense so from this definition we can see why it's the case that it is opposing permissivism because permissivism there are many alternative doxastic attitudes that anyone could take toward a proposition. So moderate permissivism says that agents may have varying degrees of confidence or different credences, if we're using fancy terms, toward any proposition P, given the same body of evidence E. So for simplicity, let's continue with the jury example. I like it, it's used uh, in like the pre-existing literature, all that type of stuff. I believe with the credence, or like a degree of 0.7 that the accused is guilty. This is based on the evidence and the witness testimonies that I was able to see during the trial. However, you, you believe the accused is guilty with a credence of 0.3. So this means that you are less confident in the guilt of the accused. So this form of this form of permissivism accepts the notion that two agents can hold credences that differ, even after evaluating the same body of evidence. So we're gonna pause on permissivism and jump into some peer disagreement here. So peer disagreement is when two people, specifically academic or academic, epistemic peers, all that, disagree about a topic given a body of evidence. In a literal sense, disagreement is related to permissivism because they hold that agents can have different beliefs about the same evidence, right? Peer disagreement says this happens, but permissivism is about whether it can be rational. An example given by... Uh, Christensen and Lackey says that we often find ourselves faced with people who have beliefs that conflict with our own on everything from the existence of God and the morality of abortion to the location of a restaurant. That seems pretty straightforward and does seem to capture like the debates that happen in our society. Disagreement differs from permissivism as the two people who are like arguing and disputing must be epistemic peers in the sense that they are on par in terms of cognitive abilities. So they have equivalent intellectual aptitude experience and yet both can be considered rational or responsible if they come to diversion conclusions with respect to that evidence. So however, permissivism still holds that they share evidence, but maybe not their conditions of like peerhood, if that makes sense. So they both have shared evidence, both can reach different conclusions, but disagreement has that like other condition that you must be epistemic peers in like X, Y, Z regard. Clear? Yeah? Mm. So arguments of disagreement 
center around what an agent should do when presented with the information that appear disagrees with whatever stance that they have taken. So for example, if the evidence I have readily available has led me to believe a certain proposition is false, and you, as my academic, epistemic peer, believe the same proposition is true, what should happen to our stances based on this information? So to further illustrate, I'm going to pull an example from someone named Rosen, or Rosen, who also uses an example of a jury. Like I said, this is a very well-known, well-used example because it seems to illustrate this point. If there are members on a jury who disagree in a particularly difficult case, when the jury members disagree, rarely do, we take that to mean that someone on the jury is being unreasonable or irrational. So this implies that both agents or epistemic peers are still rational, even though they hold different views. The question is whether those two peers should have to reevaluate or change their stance with the knowledge that they are in a disagreement. So there are two main views on how we should respond to disagreement here or like ways for an agent to resolve this new and pressing information that they have received regarding the disagreement with a peer. So there's steadfast and conciliatory. I never say the word right, that is not right. Um, I'll put them both up here somewhere, but yeah, steadfast and conciliatory, that one. So the steadfast view of epistemic peer disagreement says that it is reasonable to continue to hold your belief, the same belief you hold before learning that your epistemic peer disagrees with you or holds a different belief. The conciliatory, conciliatory? Yeah, that one. <laughs> uh, view of disagreement says that you must suspend your judgment or adopt the view of your epistemic peer. So we can see these are very different views. Um, I will talk about what I think, but just so steadfast, don't have to change your view. You keep it, keep your view. And conciliatory, I think I'm finally getting that word. The conciliatory view is when you change your view. You either suspend your judgment, so you hold no view, or you change it to that of the person you disagree with. So the best explanation of steadfast disagreement I came across was from Richard Fumerton. He has this hilarious paper. I highly recommend you check it out, whether or not you're into like philosophy or academia at all. It's called You Can't Trust a Philosopher. Um, hilarious. It's really, really well written. It's really, really clear. Anyways, check that out. I'll link it below. So in short, Fumerton argues that there's no reason for an individual to give up their stance or view just because they discovered peer disagreement. There is no need to give up what evidence has led them to when there is a continua of cognitive defect, he says. So he argues that your prior justification of a proposition of argument uh, should not be defeated just because of the discovery of a disagreement. It's the idea that the person whom you has disagree, whom you disagree with, <laughs> Uh, has reached a false conclusion, whatever that may be. There are two cases where disagreement poses no threat to your belief in a proposition. I know I have different and better evidence. I know I have analyzed my evidence well. So those are the two. Fiamartin says that it is highly doubtful that reasonable informed people are led to different conclusions by possessing interestingly and importantly different evidence. So to further illustrate this type of notion, think of a scenario where someone refuses to change their view despite overwhelming evidence against it. In the philosophy world, we call it a dogmatist, but just think of, think of that. For example, the idea of using punitive measures to dissuade people from committing crimes has been proven ineffective time and time again. So I like this example because as you folks know from my true crime videos, uh, I studied criminology in university 
And this is something that was of interest to me throughout those four years. So where the ineffectiveness of punitive measures has been proven statistically and through professional testimony, it would be strange to give up that stance simply because someone else wants to push the like tough on crime narrative, right? In the scenario, we have reason to believe the former who has evidence, better evidence, has analyzed that evidence like extremely well, right? So even though different conclusions were reached, there is a disagreement. Maintaining your view, so maintaining the view that punitive measures are ineffective is the most rational response here with the evidence presented, right? Conciliatory, getting it, conciliatory peer disagreement considers views which say that disagreeing epistemic peers should revise their belief towards the rival's belief. So this means that upon discovering your peer disagrees with you, no matter what the subject is, you should reevaluate your evidence and decrease your confidence. So in some cases, the disagreement itself should be taken as evidence that should motivate both agents to review the evidence and come to a new conclusion based on this. To illustrate this notion of conciliatory disagreement, uh, think of a possible world where the conciliatory view is the solution to disagreement. Okay, yeah, think, imagine, imagine that world, you can look however you want. If we are epistemic peers, I'm an atheist, you're a theist. Well, just the typical religious disagreement. Let's go with that. Regardless of what either our views are, it's atheist, theist. So it's evident here that we're in a disagreement, right? Yeah. On the conciliatory view, we must now both suspend our judgment. You are no longer a theist. I'm no longer an atheist. We'd be like agnostic here. So this doesn't seem like a rational way to treat belief, at least in my opinion. So for that reason, I favor the steadfast view of disagreement. In analyzing this theory of permissivism against disagreement, it's important to look at all of the angles. So next, I'm going to be looking at arguments for permissivism to discuss what merit that theory may have. The objection I would like to look at is the vagueness objection, which uh, opposes uniqueness theory and raises the possibility that justification and rationality are vague concepts. So the point of vagueness is to say that it could be indeterminate whether a certain doxastic attitude toward a proposition is justified or even which of two distinct doxastic attitude is justified, right? So this argument is an interesting one to evaluate because uniqueness theory is tremendously strong and well supported. And this argument attempts to shake its foundation, which causes trouble for the theory. So as I mentioned earlier, like uniqueness theory is one that is typically just like taken from, like for granted, like most people in the analytic tradition seem to hold this. So this vagueness theory is like taken this like rock solid cement foundation, just kind of like give a little, give a little shake here. It's not the case, however, that two distinct aesthetics attitudes are justified in this case. It would be the case that neither of them is justified, where uniqueness says that most, that at most one doxatic, doxatic attitude will fit any body of evidence. The agent must suspend judgment to remain rational and therefore uniqueness theory continues to prevail in my opinion, at least. So to contrast this, uh, Thomas Kelly in his paper, Evidence Can Be Permissive, attempts to provide a counterpoint on evidentialism, uh, specifically the point on evidentialism that is made by Roger White. 
So he says, Thomas Kelly says, sorry, I know I'm saying a lot of names. I want to make this clear. So Thomas Kelly is the one saying this. He says that the argument relies on the assumption that the relation of evidential support should be understood in a two-place relation. So E, evidence, supports P, whatever proposition, as opposed to a three-place relationship where E supports P relative to background said. So, however, this is the argument I'm making again. I want to make this clear of where there are like well-established philosophers versus a little old master student me here. So this is my argument. The background Z would be a piece of your evidence E already. So there's no reason to distinguish between the two. If you have background blah, 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 and you have evidence, whatever, for your proposition, your background's already like a part of that. You're going to take that into consideration when looking at analyzing your evidence and going forward to make an opinion. P. So Kelly's argument is an unnecessary attempt to poke holes through evidentialism, which is the orthodox and widely held view in epistemology. A similar argument is presented by Peels and Booth, where they explain that S and S prime have different cognitive abilities and background assumptions, which cause the two agents to form different beliefs. To relate this to back to like Kelly's example, Rick and Peels are illustrating that background Z includes the notions of cognitive abilities and background assumptions. Therefore, if S and S prime have different backgrounds of belief, then that becomes a part of their evidence right? Maintaining a twofold relation uh, with like that evidential support. So given a body of evidence, they chose the most rational stance or a conclusion, maintaining evidentialism. So now that we've kind of like looked at this objection, which is arguing in favor of permissivism, Let's now look at more at some arguments that are against permissivism. So though there are quite a few arguments, the defenses that I find to be the most compelling come from Roger White, specifically his paper titled Evidence Cannot Be Permissive. So I know I've thrown around his name around. Okay. Oh my goodness, I cannot speak. I know I've thrown his name around a lot, but highly recommend checking out this paper. He's extremely clear, which is why I like him a lot. And his arguments are very compelling and valid, like logically valid, not just like, oh yeah, that's a valid point. Like they're actually logically valid, which is important. So consider first an example uh, from the arbitrary switching objection. This one is what convinced me, A, to write this paper and B, that permissivism was whack. So he's done it here, I think. You, a permissivist, are being chased by a hungry tiger that escaped the zoo. Your evidence leads you to rationally believe that path A, so consider you're at like a fork, path A, path B. So path A will lead you home and safely away from the hungry tiger. And you also rashly believe that path B is going to lead you straight over a cliff. You should choose path A, right? For the sake of rationality and for the sake of your life. However, as stated above, you're a permissivist, right? And then let's just say that this situation is one of strong permissivism. So therefore, you believe it to be rational for someone in your position, one of strong permissivism, to choose path B instead. That is completely rational. It is argued that this irrationality or willingness to act in opposition to your better judgment is what makes the permissive position quasi-acratic. So quasi 
is used to show that something is almost, but not completely the thing described. An acrotic is the decision to act contrary to your contemplated judgment. So the permissivist believes that taking path A is the rational thing to do. However, they want to believe, they want to, they want to so bad, believe that path B is an equally fine choice because they need to, to uphold permissivism. If both paths A and B are rational, why not switch your belief? Hmm? You as a permissivist, you chose path A. If it's a, both irrational, pick path B. Go over that cliff. White asks us to consider the existence of a belief switching pill, which upon being taken, gives us the belief that path B is a correct and rational path to take. Since the very definition of permissivism says that alternate conclusions are acceptable and rational, you can't think there would be anything wrong with you, epistemically speaking, if you had believed that B is a safe path to begin with. So continuing on with this example, let's evaluate the arbitrariness of permissivism, just like in general. White provides an example of a jury. Again, what a surprise. The jury example is all over the place. It is our responsibility as jury members to uncover the truth and reach the most rational verdict where the offender will be prosecuted if and only if they are found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If we have belief-inducing pills labored, labeled either guilty or not guilty, we have a 50% chance of arriving at the correct verdict, right? It does not make any sense to decide in this way because it's arbitrary. So for example, if you choose path B arbitrarily because you can, you would have fallen off the cliff or gotten eaten by a tiger. You have a much higher chance of reaching the correct verdict by simply following the evidence provided to you and will only rarely be able to defend permissive sets of attitudes from the arbitrariness worries we've been considering. So Simpson says that permissivism is just, just expresses a prima facie plausibility, or sorry, a prima facie plausible view about what's rational when it comes to judgments about, about how evidence probatively bears upon propositions, right? So to summarize, the two arguments that I've provided uh, so far against permissivism, they follow the format of reduction at absurdum arguments. They prove the complete irrationality that is associated with believing in permissive cases. Reduction ad absurdum is typically defined as a method of proving the falsity of premise by showing its logical conclusion is absurd or contradictory. So that's what we've been showing in the case of permissivism. All of this info into consideration, I am now going to explain the like the view I'm arguing for, which is that steadfast disagreement is an acceptable form of permissivism. So as I've already stated, permissivism and disagreement are very similar in many ways. However, they're not exactly the same. So it's been argued that steadfast disagreement favors permissivism and conciliatory disagreement favors the uniqueness theory. This is because if they remain steadfast, both agents will still have different conclusions by the end of the dispute. Whereas if they're conciliatory, the agents will have both revised their evidence and come to a singular general conclusion. So I disagree with the notion of the conciliatory disagreement. I agree with uniqueness theory. I do want to say that. But uh, as I kind of illustrated with that atheist 
and theist example, it just seems unnatural for us to think that way. The steadfast view heavily relies on evidentialism to reach their conclusion, even if their epistemic peer does not agree with the conclusion reached. So I believe that evidentialism, where it is rational for an agent to believe P just in case her total evidence E supports P is the most rational way to conclude no matter what the subject may be. Evidentialism is vital for uniqueness because uniqueness says that there is a unique rational response to any particular body of evidence. The steadfast view of disagreement is arguing exactly this while also acknowledging the fact that other agents will be mistaken or interpret the evidence differently. So from everything that we have discussed so far, I believe my stance is apparent here. I don't agree with the permissive theory in, in any form. If uniqueness and evidentialism are true, which I believe they are, you are far more likely to come to an accurate conclusion by following the evidence provided for you. The arguments surrounding disagreement are extremely compelling, right? Conciliatory disagreement seems to me unnecessary um, as your rational agent, right? Like you should follow your evidence accordingly. So as a result of that, I hold that the steadfast disagreement is plausible and acceptable. The agent is required to follow the evidence to reach their conclusion, but they are not obligated to revise upon the discovery of disagreement. Instead, they consider where the other agent may have made an error in assessing that same evidence. So though I disagree with the permissive theory, I have concluded that steadfast disagreement is an acceptable form of permissivism. As uh, Richard Fumerton says, philosophers are heavily influenced by their philosophical environment. Therefore, disagreements and disputes among peers are inevitable. There's no way to get rid of that. The example that comes to mind again is a Christian philosopher debating the existence of God with an atheist. The atheist is not all of a sudden going to believe in God after the dispute, right? The same way the Christian is not going to all of a sudden open their eyes to all the evidence and become like agnostic or irrational. All you can do is try to explain why the other party is mistaken in their belief and why you are the more rational agent in the situation. So to conclude everything, in this paper we have discussed, or in this talk here uh, that I'm reading my paper for, we've discussed what permissivism is along with examples for and against it. We've also discussed the notion of peer disagreement, the various forms and the most plausible views. We have discussed how steadfast disagreement seems like the best option and why I believe to be the most acceptable form of permissivism. As it does not follow the theory of uniqueness, but remains faithful to evidentialism, thus committing to a more rational and accurate conclusion. With this discussion, I think it is safe to say that we should take these concepts to be true. A permissivist colleague could have an unfortunate encounter with a cliff or a tiger, and by following evidentialism and maintaining your disagreement, you will safely make it home. So that is my paper on permissivism and epistemic peer disagreement. I know this is different from what I usually do, but please let me know what you think. Let me know your opinions if you have any on uh, permissivism or disagreement. And let me know if you like this type of thing. Like I have an abundance of philosophy papers. If you like me just kind of like diving into 
uh, like a topic and like my opinions on it, I'm more than happy to do that. So um, yeah, as always, thank you so much for watching. Again, comment all your opinions down below. I love to see them. Um, if you're interested in this type of thing, I highly recommend you hit that subscribe button so you can see all the things I post. Um, yes, and without further ado, I will see you in the next one. Thank you.